Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. And I would like to welcome you to Delgado Workforce IT Tech Talk Thursday. My name is Aaron Thomas, and I am the Student Success Specialist for Workforce IT. And I also have Kelvin Gibson from Workforce IT, who is the IT Program Director. Today, we have a special presentation for everyone entitled Transforming New Orleans into a Major Player in the Video Game Industry, presented by Mr. Josh Fledge, who I will introduce shortly. First, I would like to ask everyone to please double check and make sure your mic is on mute and to please hold all questions to the end or you can put them in the chat um, while Josh is presenting. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a very special guest, Mr. Josh Fledge, who is the Vice President of Business Development at GNO Inc. Josh is the lead architect behind the growth of the technology industry in Louisiana over the last decade. Starting under the Jindal administration in 2012, he built the strategy that led to many led to many of the software and digital media wins during his tenure at Louisiana Economic Development. Josh was also instrumental in creating the state's entertainment development fund, as well as designing the largest venture capital program in state history under the U.S. State Small Business Credit Initiative. Before exploring the intersection of media and technology, Josh spent four years in a classroom at St. Joseph Academy in Baton Rouge. There, Josh was chair of the computer science department and he was the youngest chair of the school's history in, 100, in nearly 150 years. Josh holds a BA in art history from LSU, go Tigers, and an MFA in interactive design from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. He currently serves as an adjunct instructor at LSU's College of Art and Design, an advisory board member for Tulane's SOPA Digital Design Program, an industry board member of the Digital Media Institute in Shreveport, and a board member of Nexus LA, formerly Louisiana Technology Park. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Josh Fletch to present. Hey, thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate the uh, the introduction and, and thanks everyone who was able to join the call today. I really appreciate it. Um, and look, feel free as I'm talking today to to jump in with you know with questions. Um, you're welcome to put them in the chat. You're welcome to to cut in. So we'll keep this super informal and and conversational if there are questions. Um, what I'd like to do to kind of kick things off is talk a little bit about why why video games you know why why is that something that we've been chasing in louisiana for for quite some time um and so to to do that i think it's important to kind of talk about um you know where games are in terms of global growth and revenue and how big of an industry games uh you know the games business is so i want to share some data points with you around that to to really put things into context um, I'll give you the history of how we landed on on games here in Louisiana. Um, talk a little bit about where we are today, uh, and then how we recruit game studios, um, and how we you know think about workforce uh, as well. Um, how to break into the industry, we can we can talk about that as well. Uh, and um, and then you know where we're going next, like what 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 the future looks like in terms of games in in the New Orleans area. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the plan today, if that makes sense to everyone. All right. So um, let's see here. I'm going to share a slide with everyone real quick. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. All right. Can everyone see uh, this slide that says, are you not entertained? Can folks see that slide okay? Awesome. Yes. Great. So, you know, step one is, is I think a lot of people don't realize, this, especially older folks like, like myself and the generation above us, how big games ha has become globally speaking. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to see here that it, it's actually now the largest single entertainment category in terms of global revenue. Um, you know, I've seen estimates that range as high as $250 billion this year. Um, this is a, a, on the lower side of the estimates in terms of global revenues from video games. This is this is 2021 as well, so it's a, it's a little bit old. But, but I think you can see that um, this is gigantic. I mean, the reality is 
you know, there's what, just barely 8 billion people, you know, on the planet. And, you know, there was an Atlantic article. Uh, certification. Oops, sorry. So, so there's roughly um, 4 billion gamers at this point. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're looking at something that's truly global scale. This is not just a phenomenon here in the U.S. It's it's all over the world. Um, and it's all age categories, right? It's young folks. It's old folks. Um, people are playing games all the time, all over the planet. And so it has very quickly become in the last couple of decades, the, the, the largest entertainment category in the world. And uh, and there's no there's no signs that that is going to slow down or, or change anytime soon. If you look at all the data and all the trends, they point to continued kind of global growth. So, so it matters to us because it matters to the world, right? So it, it you know, that that is a growing category of of wealth creation and job creation and entertainment, you know, production that we want to capture here in, in Louisiana and specifically in the New Orleans area. And so, you know, part of what we do in the world of economic development, which is a world that I've been in for the last decade, is we, you know, we want to make sure that we're working to attract these industries that are. A, growing very quickly, but B, may not be native to, to our area. Um, you know, no, there's games here 10 years ago, no one was doing it, right? Very, There might have been one or two very small indie companies, um, but for the most part, this is not a native industry to, to Louisiana, anywhere in the state. And so we work very hard to try to attract uh, these, these companies here so that we can capture our piece of the pie as this industry continues to, uh, to grow and grow. So how does it, how do things break down inside the, uh, you know, the world of games underneath this large category? I want to share another slide with everybody. Uh, let's see if I can get it pulled up here. Uh, okay. Can everyone see this? And the font's a little bit small here. Let's see if I can make it a little clearer. It says the rise of gaming revenue. Can folks see that one okay? All right, good deal. So if you look at the breakdown uh, of where we are today, you know, the largest chunk of that you know, roughly $200 billion pie is, is mobile gaming. Um, you know, so there's a handful of reasons for that. So what mobile gaming did was it opened up gaming to broader audiences, not only broader age groups, which, you know, look, whether you're eight years old or you're 80 years old, people across the age spectrum play mobile games. So it's opened it up to broader age groups. It's also opened it up, uh, you know, in parts of the world where connectivity uh, or affordability of PCs or consoles is is not is not easy. And so yet, you know, if you look at developing nations, if you look at South Asia, if you look at Southeast Asia, you know, their major consumption device is their mobile phone. Um, in some cases, they may not have PCs. In some cases, they 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 can't afford, you know, expensive, you know, PS5s or or Xbox Ones. And so their consumption device is driven by by mobile. So that's why it's it's the lion's share. So it's it cuts across geographies, it cuts across age demographics. Um, and so so most of the revenues are are from mobile. Mobile is also really good at it turning gameplay into these microtransactions, right? So love it or hate it, the the model that was created in the mobile game world was was uh, free to play, right? You download a game, you don't pay anything for it, and you get hooked on, on the game. And before you know it, um, you're asked to, you know, to pony up a dollar, two dollars or three dollars to get a new feature, to download some, you know, exclusive content to get to the next level, wh whatever that is. And so mobile's really, really good at pulling little bits of dollars out of a lot of people all over the globe. And so it, it's really driving revenue. Um, PC growth has still continued to be very strong. Um, you know, obviously ton of investment from the big the big dogs there with, with Microsoft. Um, you know, the Steam store has really driven a lot of growth and popularity on on PC. Um, but again, games for, you know, even younger audiences like like Minecraft and Roblox, a lot of a lot of that is driven by PC as well. Um, and consoles are still huge. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know what the future of console gaming looks like. I think it's going to look very different. I mean, Microsoft has come out and said they're not doing well in the console world, but they're doing well in the content world, right? They're selling games, but they're not really selling consoles like they used to be. Um, PlayStation's doing well. Nintendo continues to do well there. Um, but I think that world will look different in the future. So that's that's kind of how things break down. Look at the very top, and this data is a little bit outdated, but at the very top, I don't know if you can see where it says VR right there in pink, it's a tiny sliver. Um, I, you know, I, most of the consumption of VR is games, right? There's there's some industrial applications for sure, but but most of VR sales in the, in the world are driven by games and gamers. Um, it's still small compared to mobile, compared to console, PC, all, the, all these other devices and, and delivery methods. So um, I think that, that you know, that has a lot of potential to change. Um, Apple is going to release their VR headset, their mixed reality headset um, purportedly this summer. Um, you know, and Apple, um, Apple doesn't miss often, right? So we'll see if that, we'll see if that works. Facebook is obviously going to continue to double down on, um, on the uh, you know the Oculus Rift uh, and and various iterations and versions of of that device. Um, so the spending is continuing in VR, but the user adoption is uh, is not quite as rapid as it as it has been on on you know gaming on mobile or PC or, or console. So um, stay tuned for that. So. I'm going to jump in now and I'm going to walk folks through a presentation that we gave a few weeks ago um, on an event called GameFet. So can everyone see this brightly colored slide? Awesome. Okay, cool. So this is some of, some of the pieces and parts of of this presentation um, may not be super relevant, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, you know, seven or eight years ago, we decided to host um, kind of an open house for game studios that were that were being built here in New Orleans, and where we would invite game uh, industry people from across the country to come see what we were doing here in New Orleans. And it was a bit of a, a way to kind of also pitch them on expanding into, you know, into the region and opening up a studio here and, and hiring people. And, and, um, and so we called the event Game Fet. Um, we do it every year in the spring, right before Jazz Fest. Um, so we just had this a few weeks ago. Um, you know, we usually have 35 or 40 game industry folks come to town um, and and we try to validate that it's real, right? That, that there are actually real studios here doing real work in the industry. And uh, and and we invite some of the local game studios and, and game developers to, to come and meet them so that they can talk about what it's like to make games here in the region. And so that's the the point behind this this presentation. Um, it's a way to try to attract more game folks here. So, you know, the quick history here on um, kind of games in Louisiana. So I'll go all the way back to 2002. Uh, the state passed um, a, a bill uh, that was meant to incentivize film and television production in Louisiana. So this is at this point, what, 21 years old? Uh, the state passed the 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 first you know motion picture tax credit uh, motion picture production tax credit program, where it effectively said you come here you make a movie we'll we'll give you you know thirty five or percent back on all of the money that you spend in the state to make a movie. So, it, the program took off. It it did phenomenally well, um, for a handful of of reasons, but but mostly because Hollywood is nomadic, right? They are very used to picking up and moving productions to wherever they need to be, right? Whether it's the mountains or the city or the, you know, the plains or, you know, some exotic location, um, they're designed to, to be very mobile. And, uh, you know, that, that program did not take a lot of selling or promotion because Hollywood understands that, you know, it's, it's easy to shoot here. It's easy to get here from, from Los Angeles. Um, and we're going to give them this you know, massive rebate back on all their production costs. So about three years later in 2005, uh, the state said, well, great, if this has been working for films, let's try to get video games. They seem to be growing, seems to be a growing industry. 
So they passed a new incentive that was a completely separate piece of legislation that was modeled after the, the film bill, but it basically said, hey, you make a video game here in Louisiana, we're going to give you some rebate back on all of the costs associated with making a game. And it was like crickets. It didn't, it didn't do much. Um, and I think what happened was this was this was an example of you know well-intentioned policy at the state level that wasn't attached to an action plan, right? So we're gonna we're gonna make this incentive and then they're just gonna show up. Well, they they didn't just show up. Um, and they didn't because they don't operate like the film industry. You know, the games business traditionally, obviously, certainly pre-COVID was very brick and mortar in that people, you know, um, reported to an office, a studio, whatever you want to call it every day for years in many cases uh, to develop games. And, the, the, you know, the production timeline for some of these large games, like on AAA games, right, the, the call of duties of, of the world is, is years. It's not months. The typical production timeline for a film is 90 days, right? So they can mobilize people fly wherever, shoot the thing, go back to Los Angeles, edit it, and uh, and do that over and over again. But it doesn't work that way in games. People live in an area, go to an office, and spend years, in many cases, making these things. And, and, and in reality, too, that these two industries are very different. They were born at different times for different reasons by different people with different skill sets, and they don't talk well to one another. You know, even though often video games will license, you know, content from a movie, um, you know, we've all played bad, you know, games based on on uh, on films before. Um, they're they're infamous and they're getting better, but but for much of game history, they were pretty bad. Um, that's about as far as the integration of the two industries went. Right? Was I'm a games maker. I'm going to go license, you know, Batman or Spider Man or something like that for the game that I want to make. Um, they were very different industries, and so this incentive program sat on the books here in Louisiana for for a very long time uh, and no one was kind of actively promoting it. And so in uh, the late uh, aughts, so, so around 2010 actually, um, we spent a lot of time um, working with Electronic Arts to try to get them to consolidate their North American QA, all of their video game testing to Louisiana. And we finally convinced them to do it. Um, it we, we ended up promising uh, to build them a building on the corner of LSU's campus in Baton Rouge. And over the course of a couple of years, they ended up moving uh, a few hundred game testers to that, to that campus, to that building on the corner of LSU. And, um, you know, fast forward to 2023, they're, they're still there. And it, it swells and contracts based on what they're testing in that operation. They, they just, stopped testing Apex Legends mobile out of that uh, operation. So they let a lot of those testers go, but but the operation is still there. EA is still here. You know, at this point, I think this is their 13th year in Louisiana. And so that was really the first big um, outside game developer, publisher, what have you, that decided to invest in in Louisiana and create create jobs here. And so the nice thing was we had a we had a validated story at that point. We had a story that signal to the rest of the industry that someone that was well respected and large had come in and they were able to hire people here and the state was able to deliver that you know that incentive year after year as promised and and so that gave us the ability you know in the early teens to go really start knocking on the doors of other of other game companies um and and promoting this you know, this program. And it took a few years. It took a few years to get um, actual development going down here. But I'm going to, I'm going to roll ahead a few slides here. And if we fast forward to today, um, this is, this is where we are, um, which is, which is pretty exciting. And this is, this is not everyone. I'm, I'm probably forgetting a couple indies that are homegrown uh, and started here but but can everyone see this slide okay with all these these various logos on it so the the exciting thing is some of these companies came in as um independent studios that were well established but but independently owned um and over the last three or four years um were bought by some of the some of the big folks 
And so in exile entertainment up here in the, in the upper left is now owned by uh, Xbox studios. So this is part of Microsoft. They've got a studio on Oak street in uptown new Orleans. Um, they've been here since 2016, 2015, somewhere in that range. High Voltage Software has a studio right in downtown New Orleans. Uh, they're working uh, they're um, primarily on uh, content for Fortnite. So they do a lot of work for Epic, um, art, uh, specifically art uh, out of that group. Uh, they do some, some programming, some, some engineering as well, but it's a lot of artists working on content for, um, for Fortnite. EA, like I mentioned earlier, they're still in Baton Rouge, still um, primarily dedicated to QA, to, to testing uh, of, of games. And they've also grown a team there that does QA automation. So they've got some automation engineers that are doing that are doing testing as well. Keyword Studios is a, um, a Dublin, Ireland based uh, global game service company. They actually came in and bought high voltage software. So now these guys are owned by this large publicly traded uh, European game company, Keywords. Testronic, they opened up here like right before the pandemic. And we thought, oh, God, this is not going to work. These guys just announced and then, you know, lockdown hit. And it's actually going extremely well. They've got a couple hundred um, mostly testers working on um, Riot games. And so they're they're doing a lot of QA, a lot of testing for League of Legends and other Riot properties. Um, I'd say probably half of their workforce is in the New Orleans metro area and the other half is in the Baton Rouge area. Um, Pixel Dash, uh, born and raised uh, in Baton Rouge. So they were a startup that um, has done work on a number of, of high profile games for both Xbox and Sony. Um, they've also built their own game called Road Redemption. Um, so they have grown from, you know, two guys to a, a small studio of probably about 25 or 30 people now in Baton Rouge. And they also work with these companies in New Orleans. They've got a couple of folks in New Orleans as well. Uh, Turbo Squid. Turbo Squid was born and raised here in New Orleans and during the pandemic also sold to Shutterstock um, for 75 million bucks. It was a big, big deal. They... Um, they're a 3D art asset marketplace. So, you know, if you think about going and licensing images, you're in this case, you would go and, and buy a 3D model. You know, if you're building a game and you you don't really want to go through the excruciating exercise of, you know, making a mailbox or, you know, a house or, um, you know, a tree, you can go on to, uh, to Turbo Squid's website and, and just purchase that you know, royalty free model and stick it directly in your game or your movie or anything else you're doing with, you know, with 3D art. Um, Microsoft ran for a couple of years, their game camp here, they will come back with this as well, which is a, it's a fun way to connect with other, you know, game, uh, aspiring game designers, game developers who are trying to start, um, you know, their own game using, using primarily Unity. And um, we'll talk more about that here in just a bit as well. And then we have some new players in the space. So Big Fish Games just announced a new studio here um, just a couple months ago. So this is this is a 2023 announcement. They just hired their first person. They make primarily mobile games, casual, you know, free to play mobile games. Uh, they're based in Seattle. Um, Crop Circle Games is a startup. They got a $25 million uh, round of funding recently to make um, to make games. Um, so headquartered here officially in New Orleans. Um, poss they're part of Possibility Space, the one over here in the lower right. Possibility Space is another uh, a game company from Jeff Strain, who um, was the creator of State of Decay for Undead Labs. Um, so he sold that company and then moved to New Orleans from Seattle and started started this one. So really excited to have those guys in the market now as well. Um, and then Gripner, this is one of the newer startups. Um, Patrick Comer, Brett McCrossin, two local tech founders have had nice, huge exits from their tech company, sold their tech company and started Gripner, which is a um, it's an NFT based um, kind of games to life. You know, table it's some some connection with tabletop gaming and turning some of your favorite tabletop game characters into NFTs. So that's an interesting um, startup here in New Orleans as well. And and, and all of this is you know, did not exist. Like this slide for the most part, um, you know, 10 to 15 years ago um, didn't exist. So it's it's nice to see that we have, you know, both kind of global game companies and global brands and small local startups now all making real games 
whether it's console games, PC games, mobile games here in, in the market. And then we have these various service companies that might not be making games, but they're they're helping to work on games like Testronic, who's who's busy with a few hundred people constantly kind of testing games for for other companies. So it's uh, this is this is something that we're super proud of that this is developed and built mostly here in New Orleans over over the last decade. Um, any questions on any of this slide? I know it was dense and I was sort of going through, um, you know, slide by slide or logo by logo, if you will. But feel free to jump in if anyone has questions uh, on this one. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm just... Yep, I can hear you. Hold on, let me see. Let me switch. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yep, I can. Oh, yeah, sorry, my headphones didn't pick up. Um, I have a question about how they're reaching out to uh, New Orleans kind of development community versus like remote work. Um, I've seen Big Fish advertise for a lot of things, just kind of like looking to hire anywhere. Are any of these um, places specifically looking for New Orleans based talent or are they just kind of still mostly remote? It's a great question. Um, so, and I'll use Big Fish as the first example here. So, you know the remote stuff is 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 challenging for everyone, right? At this at this point, from a from a hirer's perspective, right? Because it's, you know, in the in the face of it, it's like, oh great, I can now you know find talent all over the world, and I don't have to worry about you know the talent near my office in Seattle or near my office in Dallas or or wherever. But the problem is the noise level has gotten real real high for these recruiters and HR folks at these you know within these organizations, and so they. I think they're still struggling to figure out how to find talent. And so what, what we're doing with Big Fish is they are gonna bring on someone uh, starting July 1 who lives here in New Orleans. And her job is to be a local recruiter and a local ambassador and and work directly with the, the, the tech community to try to figure out like who Big Fish can source from New Orleans, right? Or, or the surrounding parishes. Um, because I think the reality is that's how you're going to win this game. You, you're going to have to build, you know, like grassroots campaigns from local communities where there's talent. Um, just casting this wide net on your website and hoping that like you're going to drive good applicants uh, is is just not going to work. And it's just adds more noise to an already difficult job for these recruiters. So so we we actually are helping to support that. Um you know, that that um, Big Fish ambassador position for a couple months as it was sort of an incentive that we gave Big Fish to also, you know, to push them to engage in the local community and try to hire more folks here locally. So she's going to come on July 1 um, and, and get down into, you know, that that role, hopefully. Um, I, I wish everyone else was doing the same thing. Um, I think they're less formal in their approach. You know, I mean, some of these guys like, you know, Pixel Dash, for example, also runs the IGDA chapter, right? So they're, you know, they're sort of in touch with the indie community and and in talent that's, you know, attached to games kind of spread throughout South Louisiana. And they do that through, you know, through something like the IGDA or the big, uh, you know, game development discord that's, you know, a lot of folks are part of. So, um, but what I would love to see would be more kind of formal, plans or strategies to you know embed in the community and hire local talent um as opposed to just being like oh it's a free-for-all let's hire everyone remote now i, I think the pendulum started to swing back the other way it, and that's a long-winded way of answering your question matthew but is that helpful oh no it is i'm with um delgado i'm sorry i've been told my, i'm echoing a little bit i'm in an empty house right now i'm moving today um <laughs> but no like we want to try to develop uh projects with unity and apple and kind of help Yep. Get that need filled. Yep. Get that need filled here. And um, it'd be great to know of anybody who's actually looking to hire that talent so we can kind of streamline. Yes. The, you know, our not really students because we're in workforce development. So we're like short term um, stuff. So we'd like to do that. And I know Chris um, on the academic side, they're working on implementing Unity in their uh, their two year program. Yeah. as well so we do we definitely have an eye on filling this need it's just that what i've seen to this point has been a lot of uh remote and that's the, you know cart for the horse you know like if the people aren't here you got to hire a remote but how do we encourage them to hire people if we develop them you know 
Yeah, no, 100 percent. And I can open up some of those channels of, of dialogue for you guys directly into these studios. That's easy to do. Um, but it, please just connect with me and, and we can um, we should do that. Right. That's absolutely important. Hey, I that see sounds you. great. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Abraham, I see you have your hand up there. Do you have a question? Yes, definitely. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure can. Oh, awesome. Uh, I appreciate this information is very, very, very helpful. Um, so um, I'm out of District E, um, District E East with Oliver Thomas, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so um, actually working concerning a uh, tech alliance dealing with here in District E, um, and then also looking to go through concerning LED um, for a lot of other things as we have from other people going through their certification as economic developers in our location. Mm -hmm. And so one of the main uh, things kind of piggybacking off, um, I believe what Matthew kind of mentioned was the recruitment um, methodology behind things. And I want to ask, has there been any company that has signed a community mutual agreement concerning, um, you know, those incentives in hiring local individuals or whatnot, um, seeing that a lot of other companies, you know, they kind of get a certain incentive, a certain um, credit or whatnot in hiring a certain amount of jobs, kind of similar to, I guess, the discussion that has been at Disney with their, their scrap project that has happened in Florida. Uh, but one of the things that was mentioned in Lake Nona with their corporate office was that they were going to provide at least 2,000 jobs in that location. And yeah. so I think that's kind of been the question is, is there a community mutual agreement concerning this? Um, and or it or has there been an expiration concerning that? No. So the, so the, the short answer to the first part of your question is, is. No, none of these none of these guys have like an official cooperative endeavor agreement that that would bind them to that sort of metric or goal. The only thing that, that they would compel them um, is in the digital interactive media and software development incentive, which is a statutory incentive that most of these guys use to, to you know, receive these rebates back on their production costs. They are incentivized to use Louisiana resident labor. So if they if they use someone who's not a resident of Louisiana, um, who the work has to be done here. But if they bring in someone from California and that person's only here for six months working on a game, they only get 18 percent on that person's labor. They get an extra seven percent for using Louisiana resident labor. Now, I think that's that's nice. But the reality is because these production cycles are so long on these games, everyone who's working for these companies now has become a Louisiana resident, whether they were hired from somewhere in Louisiana already or they've moved here from somewhere else. So they're all these studios are receiving that 25% on virtually all of their people because, again, they're not just here for six months or 30 days. They're here for years. And so I think there's a real discussion to be had at the state level around building other accelerants into the policy that would um, provide incentive for them to hire locally. You know, so if hey, you're going to receive this this benefit from state taxpayer dollars, how do we incentivize you to you know or, or hold you accountable for you know more local more local hires? Um, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a, a policy discussion to have. It's it, it'll probably be year after next because it didn't come up this fiscal session um, in the in the state house. But but it's it's worth exploring with LED and planning to build some of that and to improve you know continue to improve this incentive, uh, incentive for for those types of efforts. Um, if that's if that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Good. All right. I see Chris. You had a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, kind of a question, kind of a statement. Um, it's kind of to address a bit of what Matt was talking about. Um, so um, I wear a few different hats, but um, one one of them is I work with Delgado, and we're and and what we do is is to to try to kind of open up opportunities for Louisiana residents. Is one of the things that we like to do is we like to approach these studios and talk about potential internships and things like that that can potentially happen after somebody graduates from Delgado from the um, game developer program there. Um, and right now, actually, thankfully, some from your offices, um, <clears throat> Mary Lechapelle has, uh, has uh, connected us with Big Fish. And I'm, I'm looking forward to those hires when those right. happen. And that's really exciting, actually. Um, um and then also um thankfully like I, i'm not going to go through all of them but um uh, another startup 
Scripner. Uh, we've had some chats with Mary Legendre at um, uh, Revelry, which that kind of came out of, which is another incredible uh, story right there too. And then one of the other hats that I wear uh, is I also am an executive with the New Orleans Game Developers, which is a uh, community organization, probably similar to the fellow who was speaking earlier. Um, and what we try to do is we try to invite um, executives or hiring managers, folks from various studios in Louisiana as well to, to give presentations when we hear that they're looking to hire, uh, mm -hmm. because we do kind of have a captive audience of um, some professionals, some hobbyists, some folks that would would take part in an event like Game Camp. So, uh, so there are community organizations out there that are reaching out and, you know, thankfully with GNO's help and LED's help, we're able to make those connections and, and hopefully foster some opportunities, whether it comes to policy decisions or not. Uh, we're trying to fill the gap for kind sure. of those more structured uh, types of situations. Sure. sure. Yeah. No, I think, you know, so I'll pull back a little bit. I mean, I think it's, it's, this is a baby industry compared to well-oiled legacy industries. You know, it's interesting. I, I had a, I, I've been working in, you know, tech for a long time. And to me, it feels like an old industry, but, but you know, just because I'm an old guy has been doing it for a lot of years, but, but the reality is it's not, especially games. I mean, this is, we're talking about three decades, you know, max ish, three and a half. I mean, there was some stuff happening in the eighties, right. But it was real small. And so I had this chat with uh, a, a gentleman a couple of weeks ago in Plaquemines Parish who ran, um, he basically did, transportation for offshore, you know, um, stuff, right? So like skilled labor for the oil field, basically. And so he was talking about all these various kind of like training programs for apprentices that go from, you know, just learning how to weld or whatever that is all the way up to, you know, great salary position working in this industry. And I was like, man, that's, that's amazing that it's that, you know, well oiled why why what's so hard to do this in something like games and he's like they're just babies he said when you're babies you just steal from each other all the time right and that's you know and I, I think as much as the games industry is trying to to grow up they've got a lot of challenges right i mean we've seen this over the last few years in games a lot right i mean they have challenges around their culture you know um they've got challenges around you know diversity um they've got they've got challenges with how they get entry level talent into the workforce um, because they don't, they don't, in a lot of cases have structure in place to say, you're coming right out of school. Here's, here's how to enter this world. And here's, you know, here's your path forward. And it's very, it's, it's very ad hoc, right. And it feels sort of broken. Um, and, and so I, 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 it needs to grow up, you know, and I, I wish if there's a policy way to help them, you know, if that pain point is is the cost of internships or, or, you know, some kind of incentive to, to build a more structured version of that. I'd, I'd love to figure it out. I'd love to keep talking about that. Cause I don't know. I, I think, I think these guys need to be kind of spoon fed what that looks like um, because they uh, they're just they're Yeah. They still just like steal from one another, you know, and it's just not good. Yeah. No, I like what, what's happening with quality assurance because that is the atypical kind of entry level position. Yeah. And so it makes sense that in kind of a uh, fledgling market, you'll see more of that. Um, people can kind of uh, opportunities can be around quality assurance and they can kind of develop uh, skills that way, at least. And then with some training or education to kind of temper that and maybe some experience um, <clears throat> that can kind of grow up into something um, a little bit bigger. Um, yeah. And so I'm glad that, that, you know, organizations like Pestronic, Keywords and Big Fish are, are kind of looking at that perspective. So it's yep. pretty, pretty useful. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it is. It's a, it's, it's definitely a good segue. You know, the nice thing is if you look at the studios that are involved in, in game development, most of them have an ex EA or on their staff, you know, somewhere who's gone through that machine of like, Hey, I tested for EA. Um, and now I'm with an exile or high voltage or, or whatever. And so, you know, that's a kind of a healthy ecosystem that, that they're picking those folks up. That's good. Um, you know, same with pixel dash, right? Pixel dash has done work for these guys, right? So they pixel dash has done a lot of like, 
um, you know, overflow work for in exile. And that's what we want to see. We want to see someone come in with outside money and resources, make, you know, hire people here locally and also hire vendors, hire contractors here locally to help them build their stuff, right? Because it elevates Pixel Dash as the quality of their work. They get to say, hey, I've got credits now on some of these big Microsoft exclusive titles that I didn't have before these guys were here. So that's, you know, it's it's all starting to gel into what looks like a pretty healthy ecosystem, um, which is which is exciting. But there's a lot of work to go on the entry level pathway. You know, I, I mean, that's uh, it's just not easy. So it's, I think it's the, the best thing that we can do today is like continue to just build relationships with these guys so that we know what they're looking for. We know, you know, how we can align, you know, uh, a clear pathway. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're mostly easy to work with, right? In the local market, right? These guys are mostly, you know, they're, they're in it to win it here. Um, many cases, you know, they've been here for, you know, high voltage has now been here for almost 10 years, I think next year. So, um, so there's there's a lot to like about the direction we're going, but there's a lot of work to be done, I think, on on this pathway situation for sure. So one of the things um, I know you you mentioned it, uh, Chris, and I think it was Matthew earlier. You know some of the Unity work. Um, you know one of the last things I did before I left the state and came to GNO was was to um, to help set up this Unity certification program. Um, big believer in in you know, unity as the gateway, right? Like if if students can come out with some working knowledge of unity, it's going to give them a leg up. I think, you know, in the old world of, of making games, you thought I'm a programmer or I'm an artist uh, or a tester. Um, I don't need to know the engine, you know, especially if I'm an artist. But now, um, especially if you want to work in a small studio, you kind of got to do a little bit of all of it. You have to understand how the engine works and how it's the place where all the magic happens now. Um, so, you know, you have to understand how to bring your 3d models into the engine and manipulate them. Um, so I, I think this is the single best, you know, kind of entry point into the, into the ecosystem is, is learning unity, right? I mean, hands down, I see a question hand raised from, is it Garen? Yes, it's, it's Garen. Um, yeah, you kind of answered a couple of questions that I had regarding, um, entry level positions, um. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a question regarding diversity and um, I was, I'm currently a um, full stack engineer at ADP in Alpharetta, Georgia, but I'm a former graduate of Southern University in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. And I was at Southern during the time when DXC moved to town mm -hmm. and they had a incentive package where they partnered with a couple of um, regional universities to try to build the workforce. Um, personally, I felt that was great. Mm -hmm. um, my university, Southern in Baton Rouge, implemented a lot of cloud computing courses and things of that nature. And um, uh, it allowed us as students at the time to get internships. I personally got an internship with a couple of the students at um, GE at the time when they were in New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. But I do find that uh, most of the students that graduated from, I, I guess we can call it the DXC class of Southern Computer Science Department, mm -hmm. we have all been kind of forced to other markets um, like Atlanta. I'm currently in the Atlanta market, but mm -hmm. other students were are in now in Dallas mm -hmm. as well as in Atlanta. And I see that we have all these video game companies moving into town mm -hmm. and they they're speaking of diversity and i want to know if they have any type of plan to work directly with some of the local hbcus or even high schools in new orleans to kind of spearhead that um those those types of diversity goals mm -hmm. and, and nature of like that because we we gain these types of um experiences and we get these resources when these companies come to town but it's kind of like we want to stay home in new orleans or in baton rouge but we're kind of forced to leave the market because these companies really don't have entry-level positions at the time right yeah. right now i wouldn't qualify for entry-level positions but i'm just speaking of you yeah. know the students that are currently in in yep. school now so um i just want to know more about that 
Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you're, look, it's it's tough, right? We're still a small market. I mean, there's fewer people in the state of Louisiana than there are in the Atlanta metro area. Um, and so it's it's tough, right, when it when it comes to competing against Atlanta or Dallas or Houston, because all three of those markets are larger than the entire state of Louisiana in terms of population. So our while our, our growth is good and it's it's good that we've seen some of these guys come in, um, you know, the reality is we're still small. And so it's going to take a lot longer to kind of continue to build inch by inch to be, you know, closer in line with with some of these mega markets like Atlanta or Dallas or Houston. Um, so so on the DXC thing, I, I can talk a little bit about how that the sausage was made with that deal and then how it is not the same as these deals. Um, and and it really comes down to size. And so typically what happens when a company says, we're interested in doing something in, in Louisiana, um, they will strike a deal with the state. And that deal is contingent upon a commitment of hiring a certain amount of people. The more people they commit to, um, the, you know, the, the more sort of dollars can be dedicated to initiatives that are going to suit that company. So in the case of DXC, it was a lot of jobs they'd committed to, and the state said, great, we're going to take 25 million bucks, and we're going to dole that out to universities across South Louisiana that are going to become these engines for hiring into, into DXC. And so it was, it was all built on the back of this kind of very large job commitment, so the state literally just runs an ROI model that says, if you create 2,000 jobs, here's how much money it's going to generate and you know revenue for the state, we can afford to take this little chunk over here and dedicate it towards these workforce programs. And so that's what happened with, with DXC. And it's good. I mean, they were, they were, you know, it was a great gateway and it continues to be a great gateway for a lot of entry-level talent coming out of HBCUs and, and four-year schools and two-year schools, you know, all, all of the above. So the challenge we've had in games is that if I go back a couple slides, um, none of these folks committed to that many jobs, right? In many cases, these are smaller studios of 40 to 50 people. The testers are the only um, outlier there and that they do have a few hundred people, but none of them are at this like thousand person you know, level. Um, and so because they were coming into the market, they didn't have that leverage to say, I want you state to take these millions of dollars and give them to these HBCUs or these, you know, um, public universities or, or these two year schools or whatever. Um, so recognizing that was a problem, but seeing an aggregate, a lot of jobs growing here, uh, mm -hmm. we, we found money to, to work with unity uh, across the spectrum, right? To say, look, we we need to we need better programming at the two year and four year level that's aligned with with games um, and or anything industrial visualization period, taking three D you know content and putting it into an an, uh, an engine, and so that's why we found the money to um, to enter into this five year agreement with Unity, where they were going to help. Uh, train 15 trainers around the the state um, mm -hmm. that go back to their respective campuses and then train, you know, 20 to 50 Unity certified engineers on, on an annual basis. That's sort of the rough goals. And Delgado is a participant in that, you know, in that program okay. as well. So, um, so that was a way I, I got, so I, the DXC thing was great. I got super excited when we, when we built that, but meanwhile, the game stuff is my love, right? And, and I, I never had the leverage with any one of those projects to go claim those kind of DXC level dollars until we had this kind of critical mass. I was then able to go say, all right, let's just do this kind of horizontal program with unity and get it rolled out. And, and cause it is, I, I do believe the best gateway into the industry is, is becoming a unity engineer. Okay. So I know it's, again a long-winded way. I can I can talk about this subject for a long time. Um, we'll we'll get there, right? I mean, I would love for for us to be at a place where you know Activision or someone says we're going to commit to you know thousand jobs, and at which point we can then go and and you know build some very specific programming with you know the Southern campuses or with you know Xavier or Dillard um, or or kind of you know all the above. Um, but it's just mm -hmm. we've not had the one project that's kind of large enough to do that with uh, with the games industry yet. Okay, thank you. I understand you. Yep. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yep. I see another question from Chris. What's up? Sorry, just to, just to kind of touch on um, what you were talking about with Garen, um, I think now is a good time to kind of mention maybe some of the things that uh, that have been happening in the education space because they they relate to exactly what we're talking about here. Um, and so 
uh, LED to, LED did a solid and set up this partnership with Unity. And then what happened is the schools, one of them being Delgado, we picked up the ball. And then uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Matt Williams and I from Workforce set up IBCs based on Unity, which now enables uh, them to be uh, Unity certifications to be recognized uh, statewide. Uh, and then what we also did, uh, part of the project that I was working on was to partner with some of these studios to find out what it is that they needed, uh, what they wanted to see in entry level jobs. Uh, a few of the studios here in Exile, Pixelash, Kinematics, High Voltage. Uh, we worked with them to determine what it is that, that they wanted to see. Uh, coming in for kind of an entry level position. Mm -hmm. And then what we did is we started baking that into our program. Um, we partnered with them and brought them on as uh, built advisory council members. Uh, we, we updated curriculum. And then what we did, and this is one of the most exciting parts for me, is we went to the state and looked to be recognized in the fast forward dual enrollment program. So uh, what can actually happen starting as of next year um, to kind of answer a bit of what it is that we're talking about when we look at high schools, um, is that students in uh, Louisiana who are taking part of the fast forward program, they can actually graduate with an associate's degree from Delgado in game development. And then potentially by the end of that high school uh, program, so they'll have that associate's degree, they could potentially get a job right out of high school. Awesome. So yeah, I'm really excited because 16 year old Chris like wasn't able to have any of those <laughs> yeah, opportunities. I know. <laughs> Yeah. So it's pretty exciting, but schools like that are doing that in Louisiana, and it's and right. it's kind of just building the pipeline into what it is that the studios want and need, and trying to create opportunities for them. Of course, we can't get them to sign on and say that they're <laughs> definitely going to hire students. So we, mm -hmm. the best thing we can do is try to prepare our students, get uh, get them in front of the studios, get them those opportunities to get the interview and things like that, and then hopefully get a job. Got you. Thanks. That's um yeah, that's I think that's what the area needs more to to build that critical mass for the workforce in that particular area. So yeah. um yeah, that's really yeah. exciting. No, it's awesome. And and that was always our challenge, right? Is that like a lot of a lot of the those logos we were talking about earlier, you know, we had to like really beg to convince those people to take a leap on a market that didn't have a lot of like shovel ready gamer talent. And and we you know, we, my goal, my dream here is let's, I want to be in a place where like, I don't need to talk to these developers ever anymore because they know that we are producing talent here and they're inbound, right? Like they're, they're picking up the phone and calling us. I don't want to pick up the phone and call them. It's not that way yet, but, but that's, that's the dream, right? Is where we produce enough talent to where these guys just, they, they, they know they're smart. They know where the talent pockets are around the world. And so um, I think we got to keep, keep building these programs like that. And that's really exciting to hear, Chris. I see Abraham, you got a question up, uh, hand, hand raise as well. Yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, great information um, Chris just mentioned. Um, I did want to kind of expound um, concerning, I know in District E right now, we have a lot of great projects that are happening, but one of the things that I recognize after talking with one of the groups, Quickstar and um, might have been Verizon, concerning another program that we were expanding out in District E uh, was um, we have empty uh, major commercial buildings that we wish to have, uh, I think kind of similar to what you mentioned earlier in bringing a building, actual brick and mortar location for someone to kind of come out. And that's kind of having a workforce development location. We want to have that in District E because a lot of projects looking to have development, it is one of the largest areas um, demographically wise in New Orleans. And it makes sense to have uh, a gamer location to help work, uh, focus on workforce development in that location. We would love to have, actually, I'm glad Chris is on the line because I want, we want uh, Delgado to be over, as part of that workforce development there. I think it's just kind of been a lot of, different silos because everybody's kind of working on and being busy. But having Delgado as a workforce and having a brick and mortar location has been one of the things we're, we're really desiring 
in that section because we know that's the missing glue in yeah. the area. That's great. No, that's great. I, I, I think, look, I'm a huge believer and, and, you know, the, the best way to learn is, is to be adjacent to other learners and, 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 and experts. And so you got to do that in physical space. Um, you know, the, the challenge that we're still facing in the games industry is these people love to work from home and it's been, you know, they are, they're holdouts. You know, in a lot of cases, um, that pendulum has not kind of swung back the other way yet to where they're reporting to, you know, to an office location every day. But I, I hope we'll get there. I mean, the reality is people are still people and and, and want to get together. So um, so I've been given the five minute warning here. Um, so we have time <laughs> for maybe one more one more question from uh, from the group. All right, going once, going twice. All right, that's y'all. Thank you so much. This is super fun. I could I could do this all day. Um, if there's any other questions? Um, I don't know if. Um, let's see, Team Delgado, you're welcome. Whether it's Michelle or Aaron, um, to to share my contact information. Um, happy to connect. Happy to you know dive deeper into some of this stuff. This has been my passion for the last almost decade. So I'm um, I really appreciate y'all's time today. Well, we appreciate it, Josh. Um, and, and Aaron will share it, the contact information um, with you. So, Josh, we definitely appreciate it very much taking time out your busy schedule to uh, give us some very informative information about what's happening in the, the local um, ecosystem when it comes to gaming. Um, I see there's a lot of um, powerful people here on the, the, the chat, and so I appreciate you guys taking time to join us. Um, as well. So we appreciate it. If there's anything that Delgado can do, please let us know. Um, Aaron, if you don't mind, uh, there's some information in the chat um, about, um, Aaron's getting ready to pull that up, about our um, website for our, our courses, other courses that we offer. Um, and so feel free to reach out to us. And uh, thank you, um, Delgado, on the academic side as well for, for joining us today. Uh, is there any final questions, um, anyone, before we, we close out? Ms. Kimberly? No? Okay. All right. I saw your hand. I didn't know if you were waving it. Uh, so again, um, Aaron just put the, our website in up there, uh, www.dcc.edu slash go slash IT. And, and that shows all our uh, courses that we have to offer. We do have um, a Scrum Master course coming up here soon. So I would love to see some of you guys in it. If it's something that is of interest to you, please reach out to, to us. Uh, actually, I'll scholarship you guys in if it's something that you would like to take. So uh, if you have any questions about it, let me know. Um, but again, thank you guys for taking time out to schedule this afternoon. Um, you know, Have a safe, happy um, holiday weekend and everyone enjoy themselves and we look forward to uh, collaborate again soon. Thanks, everybody. Good to meet y'all. Thank you. All right. It's a pleasure.